Hello everybody. Uh, it's great to be here with you today in this post-lockdown but still high alert uh, online version of the Durham EcoFest. My name is uh, Charlie Roding Pemberton. I teach a little at Durham University and I also write about food and faith and charity. Uh, between the spring of 2016 and the end summer or late summer of 2018, I volunteered at County Durham Food Bank. Now, going into this kind of research, I was aware that there was already a fantastic book available by uh, an excellent scholar called Kaylee Garthwaite, um, writing about uh, food banks in Middlesbrough, about health inequalities in the UK, and about the experience of food banks um, users' lives. So I was interested in some different questions. I was interested first in the question about uh, faith, the faith motivation of volunteers, whether that's uh, Christian or, or otherwise. Uh, and also this second area about the relationship between food banks and the food industry. Uh, food banks are obviously uh, redistribute a massive amount of food, sometimes from very large supermarkets or food corporations, and where those food corporations have really bad production or manufacturing practices, this really needed to be highlighted and looked at, I thought, in more detail. We're told a lot, aren't we, that we live in a secular society, but talking to the people who came to the food bank, that just did not seem to often be the case. Either they had had some experience of religion and spirituality in their own lives, or their parents or grandparents, or a chaplain, or a social worker, or a teacher. They, very often I found stories about um, religious life, about spiritual hopes and aspirations. I often ended my interviews by asking people, what do you hope for? Um, what are your desires looking into the future? And almost always the answer came back, well, I hope for enough money to be able to provide for myself. I hope for enough uh, food for my children, uh, for my, my parents, for my grandparents. I'm hoping for stable work, for good housing, for a family life. I, oft, I talk to volunteers about the same kinds of questions. I can remember very clearly sitting in a volunteer's front room, drinking a coffee, let's, let's call her Sarah for the sake of it, and listening to her talk about her own experience of, of coming to the food bank and how that had changed her perspective. She was a former Durham undergraduate and she had loved her studies, but she'd found that coming to the food bank, she had met a group of people and been exposed to a need that she just wasn't aware of, but what it had elicited in her furthermore was a desire to hope, uh, a hitherto not yet realised and expressed uh, desire to, to serve and to love these people. She told me uh, at one stage, I would say that I had no idea what hope was until I started volunteering at the food bank because I didn't need it, because my life was fine and I had enough to eat and I knew I was saved or knew Jesus or however you want to phrase that. So I had no need for hope or need for an understanding of it. I think there are two things really worth noting here about, about hope. The first is that for Sarah, volunteering had brought her into a relationship with a group of people whose lives are systemically hopeful in troubling ways. If you're like her, or, or like me, and you don't need to hope for the most basic and universal of human necessities, we'll be thankful for it. But I think the responsibility is also on us to ask what conditions have made possible this control of the future? What of them are good? What of them are bad? What of them are dangerous and potentially uh, illusionary? Second, though, I think we are liable maybe to see hope as a kind of asset, a kind of possession, a kind of positive, a kind of capacity. But for Sarah, it was exactly the opposite. For Sarah, hoping was coming to realise that there were things out of her control, things beyond her power to affect and to change, that there were needs that she could not meet. Hope wasn't something that she had, 
Hope was how she had been grasped by people, by how her compulsion to love had taken her out from herself and made her vulnerable and made her weak to the whims and wills of other people's lives. So why do I tell this story then about Sarah and what do I think it says about, about hope? Well, if you want to help reduce food insecurity in the UK, and this is a huge and current problem, there are many things you can do. And there are many people who have written on this topic, including myself. But I've raised this story and I've told it because I believe that it is important to think not about just hope in action, but hope in reception. Not just hope as a capacity and a power and as something that that leads to what we do and to things within our control that we can exert, but hope as being held by something, by being grasped by the world in sometimes quite surprising ways. So it's not just about you or about me, about our power or our capacity, but it, hope is about weakness, about availability, about compassion, about our limits. It is a mature hope beyond a fantasy of control. It is not about what we hold, but how we are held. I believe hope is an orientation to the world. There is much more that could be said about hope. I'll leave it there for now. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you to the organizer of this event. Thank you for your time. Um, all the best. <laughs>